it is not actually Islam or a religion, but it is people. It is people who are yes. causing these divisions. It's people. One, this is my opinion. Islam, we say, and religion, in essence, forget the, the names, are, is perfect. It teaches us to be better people, better human beings. It teaches us to be more honest, more spiritual, more moralistic. What's happened is there's people who are, in many cases, self-appointed sheikhs, self-appointed scholars, self-appointed clergy, who put themselves in a position and they're writing articles, fatwas or, or papals, disrespecting groups, organizations and personalities. So this is the issue. It's not really the, it's not the religion. It's people who put themselves on pedestals and positions within religions. Okay, now, let us leave America. Yes. Come back here to the UK. Yeah. Are there mosques uh, basically for, for blacks only? Or, or, or what, what is the treatment between black people and Asians? Say, so for example, if you are in the same mosques, what really happens? Okay, the reality of the situation was, we have to um, take it in this context. Yeah. In the, when Muslims first came to the UK in recent times, in the 60s and 70s, there were really community centres that, that were undercover mosques. They weren't saying a mosque, they were community centres. So it would be the Asian community centre. And it would mainly be Asians from a particular tribe. And this would be their centre. And then they only, predominantly people from their tribe would go to that mosque. So what would happen back in the days, even if an Asian Pakistani man, someone who came from, was a, a Patan, for example, and then someone a Punjabi went there, sometimes that Punjabi might not be treated favorably. That is among them. Now, what was happening when African and Af and also there were Nigerian mosques as well. There were Nigerian mosques, Kenyan African mosques, Ghanaian mosques, and many other African mosques as well. They were there were mosques for African people where they used to go. But they wouldn't say the African mosques, as you know, by nature, African people are welcoming people. So they wouldn't say this is a Nigerian-only mosque or a Ghanaian. They might say it as a joke. This is a Nigerian mosque. Everyone's allowed here except a Ghanaian. You might hear that joke now and again. But um, the African mosques were very open. Then what happened was when public enemy, I'm going to be controversial, people are going to disagree with me, but I know this for a fact, when Public Enemy came on the scene in the early 80s, um, even, yeah, I'll put it there. So, actually, there were, Af that, that's my age. So many young Afro-Caribbean people came into Islam. And many young Africans of Christian parentage came to Islam. And many young Africans who were born in Muslim families who weren't practicing came back to Islam. So, when we came into Islam, we said, yeah, we're Muslim. We're going to a mosque. Regardless. Regardless, we don't care. Islam, the mosque is the, for the, is the house of Allah. It don't belong to no man. I don't care what man bought it, it is the house of Allah. So we, I'm talking about my generation, we used to go into the mosque and pray. Whereby before, there was a code of conduct. Salaam alaikum. We just go there, pray, sit down, have a joke, crack jokes and whatever. So this is where the rift came, because the Asian Pakistani mosques, they were saying, what are these people doing in our mosque? Because they're the ones that save the money, they're the ones that fundraise for it, they're the ones that paid for it. So they would look on it as theirs. But when our generation were going to the mosque, we were looking at it as, this is our mosque as well, even though we never paid a penny towards it, even though we never don't pay a bill towards it, we were seeing it. So this is where the rift started to come. Now, before we came to Islam, there was a group called um, Anzawa Allah that was a man called Imam Isa at the time, in, during the late 80s, um, around the time of public enemy as well. And he taught a brand of Islam which was a mixture of Hebrew, Hebrewism, Christianity and Islam mixed together. And they were called Nubian Hebrews. And they used to draw pictures of the prophets and he drew all the pictures of the prophets as black people okay so what some of our brothers who followed this brand of islam used to do is they used to go to the mosque and say do you love prophet muhammad 
And they say, yes, here's your Prophet Muhammad. <laughs> so because of the things like this. And there were other things as well. And I'm not going to say it's just one way. Because some of us came over with the bravado. And at the same time, some of these, these times, Asians wouldn't really mix with blacks. And blacks wouldn't mix with Asians. We're lucky now. We're living in a time now where we mix a lot. So in the 80s, blacks wouldn't really mix with Asians, really. So when pe in the 80s, people started to African, African Caribbean people started to go more often to the mosque um, with, that were run by Asians, um, this is what caused a bit of rift. So yes, there were racism in the mosque, no doubt about it, but not all mosques. But then after a while, there were some mosques where some black Muslims would go in respectfully, be nice. Of course, in the beginning, sometimes, like, the, like, like my group of friends, we used to go to a mosque in Shepherd's Bush. When we first used to go there, we used to go there, crack, we had a bit of our bravado, so there was a bit of a rift. Then we started to speak to the Imam. Then we found out, we was invited by a Sudanese scholar, an African Sudanese scholar to go to his house, and we saw the Imam of the Shepherd's Bush Mosque there. So he, and this is one that he considered, this African Sudanese sheikh, one of his teachers. So when he saw us there, the whole dynamic changed. So he, well, he made sure when we came there, he welcomed us, he treated us differently. And this, I would say, caused a lot of peace within the mosque. Ah, so, but okay, how did, what, what, what drew you to Islam? Me personally, what drew me to Islam is a few things. One, um, I used to listen to Public Enemy, uh, rap, hip hop. Um, Public Enemy, there's a group, there's a rapper called Intelligent Hoodlim, um, and a few others. And within their rap, they used to mention Allah, Al-Islam, the Quran. And my brother, who I was living with at the time, he was looking into Islam. And he gave me a book to read. He said, look, read this book, because a lot of your young people are on crack. And it was a book called Malcolm X on Afro-American History. So the lectures, there were, is a book of his lectures of before he went to Hajj and after he came back from Hajj. So when I read that book, that planted the seed. And then later on, I started to read books by a historian, because I really loved history, and as I still do now. There's a historian called Ivan Van Sertima. He wrote a book called African Presence in Early Europe. Then I found out he made a series, so I read African Presence in Early Europe, African Presence in Early Asia, African Presence in Early America, and We Came Before Columbus. So I read those books. I read, there's a person called J.A. Rogers. I read his books. So I started to read, and I started to say, oh my God, these are, so when I, so I was listening, people talking about Islam and Africa, and this group that I mentioned before called Nubian, Islamic Nubian Hebrews, around this time when we used to go clubbing, they used to set up a stall outside the clubs, dressed in Islamic style. They used to be promoting an Islamic African stance at the time. So I'm seeing them, they're telling us, yes, Islam is our true religion, this is our birthright, don't let any um, Asian man fool you. Islam is just as much yours as anyone else. So I thought, okay. So I thought, talking, I thought, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then when I started to read Ivan Van Setima, who was a Muslim, and he used to write about the Moors, how these African people from North Africa conquered Europe, brought civilization to Europe. Many of the great inventions that we have in Europe are due to the Moors. And then I started to read about African presence in early America, about the, the Songa Empire, Mansa Musa, and about how the, how the people from West Africa went to the Americas, including the Caribbean, where I'm originally from, 500 years before Columbus. So all these things. And then when I was reading Malcolm X and watching Malcolm X's lectures and then Muhammad Ali lectures, and then I started to look at my life and then I said, look, I want to get a Quran. So I went to Hyde Park Corner, um, through a contact, I got a holy Quran. And then from there, that was my journey.